Iron, a word synonymous with strength and fortitude. It's an element on the periodic table with an atomic number of 26. And it's an element that flows through our blood, literally, in the form of hemoglobin. And on top of that, it's the foundation of much of our built structure. However, its human origins, or more accurately, the origins of human use, go back further, far before the modern age. It is one of the seven metals of antiquity that I'm covering in this series, along with gold, silver, copper, mercury, lead, and tin. But I would argue that iron is the most important of all of them. And thankfully for us, it also happens to be one of the most abundant elements within the Earth's crust. Now, you might be wondering, why is iron so common? Well, iron is literally birthed in supernovae, usually due to binary stars, when one of them, at least, is a white dwarf. The explosion scatters iron throughout much of outer space. And that's part of the reason why both rocky planets and asteroids have tons of iron in them. But this video is not about the science per se, but rather about something that is oftentimes overlooked, the human element. So let's fast forward in time. The first widespread human use of iron probably did not come from forging iron. After all, it has a pretty damn high melting point. It most likely came from meteorites. Yeah, literally chunks of asteroids that flew into Earth's atmosphere and then crashed and burned. Ancient peoples probably had easier access to this than mining iron underground. They didn't have the technology available to engage in mining deep beneath the Earth's crust at the time. But occasionally, some would find a piece of meteorite and use that as a tool. These meteorites usually had some nickel or zinc content in them which made them more malleable for early humans. But at the same time, they were far more brittle than their modern counterparts. Throughout much of the early years of human history, or early centuries, I should say, iron was not particularly common, or more accurately, not particularly commonly used. After all, as stated before, iron has a very high melting point. And this meant that early humans first had to start off with stone, which didn't require forging and then later on moved to copper, which has a relatively low smoke point, or melting point, I should say. And then copper was mixed with tin, another soft, malleable metal like copper, which has a relatively low melting point, and that could be used to produce bronze. And hence, that's why we call that period of time the Bronze Age. Now, bronze was certainly a step up from stone. However, bronze is nowhere near as tough as iron. Over the course of centuries, iron would start to be used little by little. After all, through the use of metallurgy for bronze, techniques would improve, higher temperatures would be acquired, and our knowledge of how these metals work would enhance. On top of that, one major problem with bronze was that tin is actually not that common, at least at the time it was used in the Eastern Mediterranean. This eventually led to the more widespread use of iron, and after the Bronze Age collapse, iron became far more common. In some parts of the world, like Sub-Saharan Africa, they just kind of skipped over the Bronze Age and went straight from stone to iron immediately, at least in most cases, which shows you that you don't necessarily need to do a step-by-step -step process like a game like Civilization. By this time, humans have also excelled at deeper mining. They no longer needed to find rocks on the Earth's surface, or meteorites for that matter. And hence you saw more iron mining. With a better understanding of metallurgy, you also saw the rise of wrought iron. This is an iron alloy that combines some small amount of carbon, which makes it far more malleable. Some have argued that the Bronze Age collapse contributed to the rise of iron, because the invasions by the Sea Peoples forced many quote-unquote civilized people of the Eastern Mediterranean to acquire better weapons in order to defend themselves. This may have some element of truth to it, but at the end of the day, 
I would probably lean more on the side that tin was just quite hard to find. As a result of this, many people sought iron because it was far more common. After all, we see widespread use of iron in the Indian subcontinent and in China, places that were not hit by the Sea People's invasions. The Chinese in particular were quite fond of using iron for civilian purposes. They sort of kind of invented hydroelectric power as well. Well, maybe not hydroelectric power, but hydraulic power, using iron furnaces to create smoke that could turn wheels, water wheels, which could be used to produce energy in and of themselves. With the widespread use of iron, tin and copper became less popular. Tin took a backseat for a while before the rise of modern manufacturing, and copper was primarily used for ornamental purposes given its beautiful color until the rise of electricity. The Romans broke off from the usual trend of ripping off the Greeks and instead decided to prefer iron rather than bronze. Rather than those bronze-tipped spheres, you could produce iron swords. The most famous was the Gladius. These weren't as long and mighty as the steel swords you would later see in the Middle Ages, but they were certainly at the cutting edge of technology for their time, certainly better than their bronze counterparts. Another type of iron that would emerge would be cast iron. You're probably familiar with cast iron pans. These are composed of iron carbon alloys. However, they contain more silicon in them. If you don't know what silicon is, it's the element in your computer chips. It can also be used to produce silicone, which can be used for just about everything from insulation to fake breasts. Regardless of this, the inclusion of silicon in metallurgy production created a form of cast iron, or iron in general, that was far easier to melt. This form of metallurgy was first produced in China, well before Christ. With that being said, it had limited applications at the time, namely for civilian purposes. This is because it's not particularly hard enough to be very effective in battle. So you probably don't want to bring a cast iron sword into the battlefield when you're fighting against people with steel swords. Perhaps a cast iron pan is better for whacking people. Nonetheless, cast iron was remarkably good for mass production, since you could create molds, fill up those molds into various shapes, and use them for a variety of purposes, such as pipes, pans, and pots. Eventually, there were some military applications, but this would be centuries later, up until the modern era, where you saw them being used for cannons. And obviously, cannons aren't used for direct contact, but rather for firing projectiles. And of course, I have to move on to steel. Steel is the most badass of iron alloys. Steel is not an element. It again is an alloy that combines iron and carbon, and sometimes mixes other elements such as magnesium. It is by far the toughest of iron alloys and the most versatile. However, its origins does actually date back to the ancient world, however, in a far more limited application. For example, you may or may not have heard of Damascus steel. This was the real-life version of steel that inspired Valerian steel of Game of Thrones. These were used to produce these very beautiful swords that have this sort of swirly appearance, but for a period of time, we really didn't know how they were specifically being forged. We don't even know that much about Damascus steel outside of some of the exaggerated tales that were written in folklore. And eventually the craft died out, along with the people who knew how to produce it. Damascus steel in particular was considered to be one of the toughest and most resilient. However, again, it's hard to tell to what extent these theories were true. And chances are if you see something labeled as Damascus steel outside of a museum, it's almost certainly a knockoff. We see similar versions of these sort of fabled high-end types of steel used in other parts of the world, namely the Indian subcontinent. But, by and large, steel never became particularly common and popular until the Industrial Revolution. With the rise of furnaces using coal that could produce very high temperatures, the people of Britain could now produce steel on a mass scale. This was at the age of factories, and the age of mass production, and it made sense that steel production would be one of the key components that would build the modern age. On top of that, by the 1700s, a century before the Industrial Revolution, we had the rise of modern chemistry. Alchemy had now been replaced with the scientific method.
And now that we got far better understandings of how metals could be forged, as a result, there would be a more widespread adoption of steel in so many applications that I cannot even begin to describe. This video would be hours upon hours long. Just look at your kitchen or your bathroom. I guarantee you there's some steel in there. If you're living in a high-rise building, you are sitting upon a foundation of steel. If you have a car, your car is composed of steel. If you are in any sort of vehicle, with the exception of maybe an airplane, it's probably made out of steel predominantly. If you're in a subway, you're likely in a vehicle made out of steel, at least to some degree. If all the steel in the world vanished, your entire life and society would collapse before your very eyes. Eventually, the production of steel would shift away from the UK, which at one point during the 1800s was the center of steel production, and would move to the United States, namely in the city of Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. However, as the United States became a post-industrial economy, much of the steel making was moved to other countries such as China, South Korea, Canada, and Mexico. Throughout the 20th century, steel was considered to be, along with coal and later oil, the premier resource for military purposes. In the aftermath of World War II, the nations of France and Germany interconnected their coal and steel industries in order to make sure that they were economically interconnected. And this interconnection of the two core industries of war making would make sure that these two countries would not go to war with each other, and they would eventually become the foundations of the European Union. In more recent years, there's been a lot more attention played to iron's role in the human body. If you've ever tasted your own blood, because you're a weirdo, you've probably noticed that it tastes metallic. This is because hemoglobin, which contains iron, is, well, in your blood. It's the reason why when you open up a packaging of any type of food, you will see the amount of iron in terms of a percentage that's required for your daily intake. Hemoglobin is essential for your oxygen carrying capacity that occurs through the use of your red blood cells. This is part of the reason why they're red. After all, iron oxidizes and becomes the color red. This is true for rusting as well, as you can clearly see in the case of our blood. It's also the case that certain types of soil around the world get oxidized when they're exposed to the air or water. Today, Lean meat is probably the best source of iron, and many people have gone out of their way to take dietary supplements that contain iron. This is particularly important if you're a vegetarian or vegan, and you're not getting enough iron from plant-based sources. Regardless of this, leafy green vegetables also are very rich in iron, so you by no means need to rely on meat in order to get your daily iron intake. After all, many leafy green vegetables are planted in soil rich in iron deposits. Unfortunately, though, for many people in the developing world, iron deficiency is not uncommon. As a result of this, there has been an increased emphasis on providing people with supplements, or in the absence of supplements, leafy green vegetables and certain types of lean meat. And there you have it. That's an incredibly oversimplified history of iron. Out of all the metals that I've covered in this series, and there are seven in total, this is quite possibly the most important. I could probably make seven videos just on iron. If you want to learn more about iron, I'd highly recommend looking at a variety of books and other sources to really delve deeper, not only into the scientific elements, but understanding how those elements have shaped the social biological, and cultural world around you. Thanks for watching.